Brian and Joyce Dirksen foster a dynamic, caring life, which includes raising children with unique needs. Two of their six children are severely impacted by a genetically inherited condition called Fragile X Syndrome. Brian is an international and Juno Award-winning singer-songwriter. He and Joyce have been married for over 30 years, and their creatively infused partnership reflects the wonder and struggle of vibrant family life. You know, Roy, I was so looking forward to this interview, but I was delighted with the encouragement that I found within it. There was a sweetness to Joyce and Brian. Yeah. To be with them was to sense uh, the delight, the kindness, the the peace of their chosen narrative Mm. that they've given to themselves to make it through. The, The difficulties of raising children in a situation that they did not anticipate. Yeah, yeah. But they have foundational truths that they tell themselves that work not only for them in their situation, but for... But they apply to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. When life doesn't turn out the way you plan it, mm-hmm. which happens. It does, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. There was this crushing disappointment that we wouldn't have a normal family, that our children wouldn't develop normally the way we had hoped they would. So it was definitely a a big adjustment for us. Like I said at the beginning, though, when they're in your arms, you still love them and just who they are. So Mm. both emotions are still Mm. working together. I'm Rachel Cram. And I'm Roy Salmon. And welcome to Family 360. Conversations exploring life together. Brian and Joyce, it is such a pleasure to get to sit around this table with you and to hear more of your story and who you are as a couple, as parents, as people. So Mm. thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a question that I typically open our interviews with, and maybe, Brian, I'm going to start with you. Aristotle stated, give me a child at seven and I will show you the adult. Is there a story or an experience from your childhood that has shaped the adult that you are today? I would say one of the vivid memories from my childhood, I don't know exactly how old I was. Maybe I was seven, eight, nine. My brother is older than me, bigger than me, better than me in lots of things. And he wanted me to come outside, Brian, Brian, let's go. You know, we're, we're going to go play a baseball or something, you know, where I'd get whooped again. And I, and I gave him the, kind of like a look and I said, basically, like, leave me alone. And because what I was doing was sitting on the floor, perfectly positioned between two stereo speakers. The turntable was on and I was listening to music. Like, why would you want to go outside and be whooped by your older brother when you could sit there in the perfect spot in that stereo image and hear these guitars and these voices? Mm -hmm. So there I was. Do you remember what you were listening to? The record collection when I was a boy was fairly limited because my parents were fairly conservative. But at that point, it didn't really matter what it was Mm. because listening to that music transported me somewhere else. And, you know, I, I still do a thing called vinyl at five where I still get out a record and drop the needle and sit there in that perfect spot and just listen to the album. Hmm. Just taking it in. At that point as a kid, I would have never dreamed that I'd become a songwriter and earn my living through music. It wasn't about any of those things. It was just about losing myself in the music. Hmm. Joyce, do you have a story or experience from your childhood that's shaped who you are as an adult? I think I was a bit more on the childlike wonder side. I created doll houses and little fairs where people could come by in the neighborhood, Kool-Aid stands. I sold Regal stationery from the time I was five till I was 12. I went to all my neighbors and introduced myself and asked if they wanted to look at my magazine. And I so wish you would have come knock on my door. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and right, and I, I could think that maybe I'm not an artist like Brian, but I've realized as I've gotten older that I'm actually very creative. I'm learning some new things lately, more expressions now that my kids are a bit older of how I can express my creativity. I'm definitely creative, but very earthy at the same time. 
Mm-hmm. A different kind of artist. Yeah. Now, Brian, you're saying you wish that she'd come and knock on your door like you had to wait so long to meet her. But you oh, guys got goodness. together when you were 15, I heard. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's part <laughs> you of the were joke. were younger when you were driving by and, my house. And, so. and by the time I was 13, I had already set my eyes on her. And inside myself, I said, she's going to be the one for me. And I found out where she lived. And I would drive my little bicycle past her property, hoping to get a glimpse <laughs> It's kind of freaky, but hey, it all worked out in the end. At 13, it works. <laughs> How many years have you been married now? This year, 35. Well, we, we met when we were 13, started dating when we were 15, married one week after I turned 19. Well, I think often as parents, like thinking of your parents, you can think your children are just too young to make such a life changing yeah. decision mm-hmm. and there's a lot of validity in that mm-hmm. yes but you figured out how to make it work mm-hmm. so can you tell more about your journey you went on to have six children wow yeah it was probably a really good thing that we didn't have uh, children right away you know we, we had lots of big dreams we were going to make an impact and um an impact how what, I, what I, was what was your vision at that time i what think did you it picture? W- a vision that was through the things we did, through what we created, we would make an impact spiritually, culturally, artistically. But also just raising a happy, healthy family, too. What in your relatively short years on this planet had geared you to thinking that you and your children could make a difference? What was fueling that in your mind? We hadn't started birthing these children yet. <laughs> yeah, it's one thing to have yeah. these dreams and make these plans. Yeah. And then the real versions of those plans and dreams show up and then they shift things. Mm-hmm. And you realize what your limitations are. Mm-hmm. And it didn't take us very long to realize yeah. we're very normal, very weak in a lot of ways. I think still our heart to love and to be loved was a big part of our life, so. Mm. When we start to raise children, you can have a lot of hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. And as your family grows and as you grow as people, those hopes and dreams will shift. Can you talk a little bit about how that process has carried on as you've raised your six children? Mm. Well, the really big shift started when we had our third child and we started seeing signs that he wasn't hitting milestones, that he had communication issues. Our, our friends and people around us said, oh, he's just a bit developmentally delayed. You know, it's no big deal. Just hang on. And we got to a point where we realized that there's something fundamentally at the very core of who he is, that there's a condition, something is blocking his development. And we found out that that was fragile X syndrome and that he would require support for the rest of his life. So that was kapow. (laughs) You know, you talk about a shift. When we found out his diagnosis, our twin girls had just been born. So you had two girls and then you Uh, had your son. Isaiah. And then because it was very new, the realization of what fragile X syndrome was, it's the most common cause of an inherited mental disability. So Down syndrome is not inherited. That's the most common cause. And Fragile X is the biggest um, form of an inherited mental disability. So can... Oh, um, do, you want, do you know what the, the textbook definition is? Do you want to pull it up? I'm going to just try. So Fragile X syndrome is a genetic disorder. It's mild to moderate intellectual developmental disability So the average IQ in males is under 55. Mm -hmm. You'll have some physical features, a long, narrow face, larger ears, and they have a lot of autistic behaviors. Mm. So your son Isaiah, how old was he when you started to get him tested? So we have two boys. Benjamin is our first. So that was the shift moment for Mm -hmm. us. And he would have been... He was three. Three years old when we started started the process, yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
And I'm the carrier of it, which we did not know at all until after our five children were born. And they all carry different degrees of it. And it wasn't until Isaiah that we found out that he as well had it. Mm. So how did that land when that information became evident? I think for me, when you have your child in your arms, you don't know any different. So, of course, your life just keeps going. But at the same time, there was this crushing disappointment that we wouldn't have a normal family, that our children wouldn't develop normally the way we had hoped they would. So it was definitely a a big adjustment for us. Like I said at the beginning, though, when they're in your arms, you still love them and just who they are. So Mm. both emotions are still Mm -hmm. working together. So much thinking Mm. that must go on. There's so much processing and shifting of expectations. You know, I'm the son of an educator and still now my dad's in his 80s and I'll go have breakfast with him and we talk about what book are you reading? You know, we talk about philosophy and and theology and life and, you know, we're, we're thinking. And, you know, I have dreams. Oh, I'm going to have a son and I'm going to be able to do that with my son when he grows up. And all of those expectations come crashing to a halt when you get a diagnosis like this. But exactly like Joyce has said, when you look them in the face or you hold them to comfort them or whatever, you just love them and you accept who they are. So you have incredible joy being with them. And then you also have the weight, the weight of the future that for the rest of their life, they're going to require full-time support. That there is nothing but very basic things that they can do on their own. So you have to manage all of those things. You have to factor in their unique situation into every decision you're making. Often for parents, that kind of stress and that kind of projection into the future, typically this is going to be like a 20-year max Mm -hmm. kind of commitment when your children are at home. That kind of stress can be very weighty and challenging on marriages. Have you, how have you negotiated those? Mm. Well, I think early on we realized we don't want to have our marriage swallowed up just with raising children. As important as that is, our marriage is equally or maybe even slightly more important because without a healthy marriage, children can suffer other issues. Mm-hmm. So, You mean if a marriage is struggling, that puts a whole different weight it, on a child? It does. Mm-hmm. And I think we had all those things playing in our minds. And so we started having a date night once a week and we'd look for ways. We didn't have a lot of money. We looked for ways of doing that. And I think that Mm -hmm. made a big difference. We'd have planning times. We would plan what our next steps would be for the next month, the next year. We had lots of mini dates. We would often have a young student living with us so that we could head off to our local Starbucks for 90 minutes and just sit and... And talk about about (laughs) the day, right? Yeah, Yeah. right. And just process together. Mm. I think a tendency can be when you have one or or two children with a fairly significant need, that can start to define who you are as people. And it sounds like you've resisted that, would you say? Well, and I think too, when we realized that this was a lifelong thing, Mm -hmm. we actually, I kind of use the words, I want to be in it for the long haul. Be in be in life, be engaged in how do I do this for the long haul? Because sometimes we can burn ourselves out. We put everything into it and neglect other things, and then we burn out. Mm. And that means planning. It means realizing what our limits are, what our boundaries are, and how do we do this together? And so having kids could, like we said before, swallow us up. 
Mm-hmm. And we recognize that we have these kids for the rest of our lives. We'd be ultimately responsible for them. So we started a process of bringing other people in. So we had young college girls come and live with us. We gave them a room, a few hundred dollars, and they became like older sisters, especially to our girls, that mm-hmm. we didn't want them to be burnt out looking after kids that we had chosen to have mm. and we you wanted didn't want your daughters to, to be, be to be burned. always the ones burdened with their with brothers the responsibilities mm. and and in doing so it gave them an incredible love and tolerance for their brothers mm. it's not like they were then released from any care it actually it worked that even now nobody is trying to run away like they want to stay engaged it's like it created this extra layer of family life that took away some of the Right. stress and anxiety within by, our family life. Right. By acknowledging that we had limits and we needed help versus saying, no, we're going to sort this out ourselves. Hmm. I think that we can start life with a very clear picture of what success is going to look like. And mm-hmm. then as life progresses, we have to alter that view. Would you have a definition for what success looks like now for mm-hmm. you? Well, I think real success is totally rooted in relationship you know i mean the reality is as somebody who you feel like it's one of your key roles in life to earn enough income to support your family you have to have some level of success in order to pay your bills but at the end of the day if your family is falling apart then it almost doesn't matter whether you got that whatever that promotion or that extra great car in your garage or whatever it is, you know, for your life. So, I mean, Isaiah, who's turning 20, he has almost no speech, but he's very focused on love, very focused on giving and receiving love. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday, we were driving, he's sitting behind me in the car, and I feel this hand reaching from behind me and touching my cheek. And as soon as he touches my cheek, I'll hear this, Mm -hmm. like he makes the sound of a kiss from the back seat, then the hand gets retracted. You know, these are the kinds of things that, to me, are the great gifts in life. So that, to me, is like success. Isaiah loves me. He sees me as a, an intricate part of his life. And if I was touring nonstop, that wouldn't be the case. So I end up turning down opportunities in my career path to be a family guy, mm-hmm. you know. And in some ways, every family has its unique challenges. But when it comes down to it's literally, will we do this together? Will we be partners? Will we accept our reality as the ground in which we're planted and find love and find life? Or will we seek it somewhere else? And I, I would speak um, complimentary to that is is when when you're raising special needs kids, you're almost being driven to always try and do more and more for them. And sometimes we're doing all these things without really thinking through what their actual needs are. And so it's being smart with how you budget your time. We actually have a lot more control than we think we do. So it's really thinking through what's best for your child. How does this fit with your family, with your other kids? How does it help the person that you're partnering with? How do you work together so that you can create a peaceful family unit that you can do this for the long haul? Right. I mean, the long haul, I would say for us, probably our definition of success has to do with quality of life. Mm -hmm. and a sense that we are living in a way that we're flourishing, but we're also enjoying life, and our children are enjoying life. And that often means doing less, but doing what we do at a pace that we can sustain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have limits. Mm -hmm. Live within it. (laughs) (laughs) Do you see tangible ways that your understanding of joy, of enjoying life, has been affected by raising your sons? Mm. So many, so many ways, because they focus you, first of all, on very 
small moments, small victories, really when it comes down to, and especially with special needs kids, is it's not going to be about amazing days. It may be about having some amazing moments that become memories for our children and for us, and knowing that a lot of the rest of the day will actually be hard work. And so then you come away, and we know that there was so much work with that camping trip or that Disneyland trip, but but you've collected all these little things, so many moments strung together that bring joy to us, right? Yeah, Yeah, memories. And, And the joy is in those moments, and those are the things you remember, and you start filtering out the hours of hard work it took in order to get that moment of joy. And because you did that, they also feel that their treasure chest of memories is full because we didn't say, oh, it's going to be too hard. We won't try this. Mm. Because when you have a, a child and they react negatively to crowds, you're constantly having to manage, okay, how can we keep them not overstimulate it so that they can get to that moment and enjoy it, mm. right? The wheels are always turning. Now, I don't know if this would be true, but I'm just going to go on a little thought process here. I've been thinking that one of the gifts people with special needs bring is an immediate sense of belonging because people with special needs wear their vulnerabilities mm. right in front of themselves. They're not hidden. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering When you spent time in the limelight or leadership like you have, Brian, you could be a very intimidating person. People Mm -hmm. could feel like, I can't relate to this couple because uh, they've got it all together. I wonder if your children, (laughs) I wonder if your children have given you this. Like, do do you wear that? Do they they make you wear vulnerability in front of you as well? Mm. Absolutely. My dad calls our group of kids the happy gang, you know, they they just love each other and it's kind of noisy, it's kind of messy around the edges. I've always said as the kids were growing up and we'd go out, we were a bit of a gong show, you know, because you'd have Benjamin jumping up and down and... Yeah, stemming with uh, kind of autistic behaviors but it was, and you know, making sounds right. and when people come over and they hear some of these sounds, sometimes they go, oh, what's that? You could tell they look a little bit concerned. Oh, those are just Isaiah making happy sounds, you know, mm. he's all good. <laughs> yeah, but those are, that's the soundtrack of our life. Yeah. Mm. And we, we yeah. love, we love his sounds and course there's challenges when we take them out I always feel like I'm one of those crazy mothers with a sheen of sweat on my upper lip you know because you can't predict what they're all going to do and I think it's kind of interesting what you mentioned in that uh, maybe everybody feels like they're slightly more normal than us (laughs) (laughs) and they can feel good about themselves when they come They hear Isaiah. And, or, or, and, and it's ben. also true that because some people that know my work, if they're in that niche world and they yeah. encounter me with my special needs, oh, he's just a normal guy who's having some of the same challenges that my friend down the road who has an autistic yeah. son. We're all in this together. Can I share just a little clip of a poem that is kind of connected? Yeah, yeah. please do. You got it there? Yeah. This poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, Kindness, a very well-known poem, speaks to me of this interplay between kindness and suffering, that you actually have to experience some pain and suffering to be open to some of the beautiful things in the world. It's almost like without the suffering Everything just kind of rushes by us. Mm, I love this poem. Mm. So this is A Portion of Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. Mm. And it carries on. If you haven't heard the whole poem, I encourage you to look it up. Yeah. We have such a hunger for kindness. Well, I think in our culture, 
we talk a lot about the word love. And it strikes me that one of the things we are speaking about is this kindness, this attentiveness to each other, even in our pain and our suffering. Mm. That first line you read, Brian, before you know what kindness is, you must lose things. For many of us, that can feel counterintuitive. Have you discovered loss as an influence in how you look at people? I see all of us as people deeply in need of giving and receiving love. Mm. And the vulnerability that comes right on the surface of my boys teaches that to me, reminds me every day. But for me, in our unique situation, it shifted me from an intellectual-based view of life and of spirituality to... Which might have said what? That if you believe the right things, if you say the right things then you will get the outcome that you want or hope for. In the Bible, there's a book called the Psalms, which is poems and prayers and songs, 40% of which is lament. And in the language... Lament is a very important word. It's not used a lot right now. So what do you mean by lament? Lament is to pour out your pain and to express the issues in your life that are unresolved. But to do so in a way that expects that there's somebody listening mm-hmm. and that there can be hope for change. Even in though you words, can't define what that is. Yeah, even if you don't even define what that is, I believe there's something in all human beings that when we pour out our pain and our struggle, that there's something cathartic in it. Mm. Yeah. So where were we? <laughs> um, the shift. And how you look at people. And how you look at people. Everybody needs... And everybody is worthy of love. It doesn't matter whether they produce anything, whether they accomplish anything. The very fact that they breathe means that they're worthy of love. Mm-hmm. And sometimes um, religion tells us if you believe the right things, if you pray the right way, then you're worthy of love. And I'm telling you, with my boys it's it's really just it blew apart any kind of box that i wanted to place around that's an acceptable type person and this is unacceptable no there everybody is worthy of love i think having special needs children the life that we've led has really grounded and earthed us i'm much more wanting to be in the present mm. i'm not really that interested in a lot of things that are said from pulpits and podiums. Mm. I'm more interested in how people treat each other and how we can eat together and live together in peace. Mm. I love what you're saying there, Joyce, and particularly that part about being in the present. I'm wondering, as we start to wrap up, Joyce and then Brian, would you be able to give a piece of wisdom each on living in the present, particularly in light of families as we walk into our own unexpected realities. Probably it's adopting an attitude of living your life in a way that you can sustain it so that when you have unexpected news, you have time to process, you have time to react to it, try and and keep life as simple as possible. Because I think if we're living life to our full capacity, all the time. We're not setting ourselves up to be able to respond well to when things are difficult. Mm. I would say, keep on dating your partner. Mm. (laughs) You know, life is complicated. Life will always throw complications your way. But if you and your partner are getting to know each other through all the phases of your relationship, then you can weather the challenges that come. Hmm. I think we'll end with those two important pieces of wisdom. Joyce and Brian, thank you for all the thought you've put into this conversation. Thanks, Rachel. It was great to be here. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. You know, Rachel, as I was in the room listening to you interview Brian and Joyce, I was just really struck with the 
the sense that the inner landscape of people is sometimes so much more richer and complex than what we see in their outer persona. Oh, so true. Yeah. And Brian writes all these wonderful inspirational songs. Which you have used beautifully as music bites throughout this episode. Yes, so so was, fun. It was fun. But they became more substantive. More meaningful even. Yeah. Well, that's that they what weren't substantive before. means. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep going. They gave a glimpse into his life and the choices and the difficulties that they've had. And it gives you an empathy and an increased appreciation. Well, it's interesting. The root of the word empathy means to feel and to suffer along with. Mm -hmm. You develop a deeper appreciation. For who that person is and who we are as well. Mm -hmm. You get to understand yourself a yeah. bit better. So this interview was a wonderful example of feeling with them, but also illuminating our own selves in a, in a good way. That just about wraps it up, Roy. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Brian and Joyce. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to Family 360. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Rate the show, leave a comment, and tell a friend. We'd like to end with Naomi Shihab Nye's poem, Kindness, introduced in this episode and underscored by a rendition of Brian Dirksen's song, The River. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you've been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. I'm Rachel Cram. I'm Roy Salmond. And thank you so much for listening to Family 360. 360. To continue these conversations, find us at Family 360 on our website, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'd love to journey with you.